Hmm. When God told Israel to be holy, he was instructing them to be distinct from the other nations by giving them specific regulations to govern their life. Israel is God's chosen nation, and God has set them apart from all other people groups. Since they are his special people, consequently, they were given standards that God wanted them to live by so the world would know that they belong to him. Hmm. Let's stand real quick and we're going to read our script for today and then you can sit down and let God minister to you. It's 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. It says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he is holy, you, he has called you holy. So be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. You may be seated. Father, in the name of Jesus, today I know, I know that what you said to me, Father, I can only tell, I can only say it. I hope that I say it the way that you've told me to. I know that your Holy Spirit is alive and well. I know there are some things that you want people in this church to know, people that you want them to remember, things that you want to bring to their forefront of their minds so that they know that you are holy. You want us to be holy in your kingdom of holiness is what we're all striving for. We just give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. In those verses... The Apostle Peter lays out how we can live in the light of God's command to be holy as he is holy. Peter says to discipline our mind. So prepare your mind for action. That means movement. That means something. That means you're going somewhere. And exercise self-control. Hmm. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So we are to exercise self-control and stay alert. In other words, control ourselves, if you say that backwards, and stay alert. There's a reason to stay alert. We got things coming at us, trials, tribulations, things of life that we live through day by day. You think about it, every other minute there is something coming at you concerning this world, things that you need to make decisions about. So he he says, stay alert. Stay alert. Think about that. So, we are to exercise self-control, stay alert, both mentally and spiritually. That's very important. Because spiritually, that means that we're in the Spirit. That means that we are under the, under the uh, leadership of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is helping us to know things that are coming at us. Things are going to come at us, and when things come at us, he wants us to be alert for that and to know that's coming. And he says, that's how we prepare our mind. This mental discipline requires a concentrated focus on trusting in the Lord to get us to that final destination where we will experience the fullness of God's grace in Jesus Christ. One of these days, one of these days, we're going to be in front of, we're going to be in front of Jesus. We're going to have this, this beautiful relationship. But what he's saying is that how we keep our mind alert is that we remember that. We remember that this is only a journey. We don't let these things get us down. We don't let these things stop us. Cause, so we think out there, we think of what that's going to be like. When Jesus comes, all this other stuff that we're going through will go away. Sin, suffering, sorrow, all those things go away. So he said, first, keep your mind there. Think about that, even though you're here going through these things. So he says, the mental discipline requires concentrated focus on trusting in the Lord to get us to that final destination where we will experience the fullness of God's grace in Jesus Christ. That's the second coming. That second coming in Christ is the hope of believers that God is in control of all things. 
and his faithfulness to his promises, the things he said in the word of God, and that the prophecies in his word is true. The prophets said a lot of things. They said, I mean, you look at all the prophecies, just about every one of the prophecies have come true. So we know if that's come true, that we know our hope in Jesus Christ is valid. He says, you must live as God's obedient children. That's the action. Peter says, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. When we do not conform to the evil desires we had before we came to know Christ, we live in response to God's holiness. He's holy, be holy. Adopting his behavior as our pattern. He came to walk with us, so he came to walk to show us how to do it. So what we do is we watch him, we read the word of God, we know more about him. And as we learn more about him, we adopt that behavior. That behavior is what makes us holy. But it ain't always easy to choose obedience to God. I know everybody in here knows that. We can say that, but it's tough. Especially if we're trying to do it on our own. Satan would love nothing more than to bring us back into bondage through disobedience. And he's out there. But we have this promise. The word says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Them are false prophets. Because one who is in you is greater than the one who is in this world. The Holy Spirit will produce Christ-likeness in us. And as we yield to him, we can live a holy life. Yeah, but one of the most difficult things for a Christian life is the fact that becoming a disciple does not immune us from trials and tribulations. Hmm. The Bible clearly teaches that God loves those who are his children, and he works all things together for good for us. So that must mean that the trials and tribulations he allows in our lives are part of that working together all things for good. Therefore, for believers, all trials and tribulation must have a divine purpose. That's how we look at it. When God changes our heart, the Holy Spirit comes in and we look different. Amen? That change of behavior begins on the inside with our attitude and our mindset, or how we set our mind. When our inner thoughts Life, thought life, our purpose, what we're doing every day while we're here, and our character, which is our personality, are changed into the image of Christ. Our outward self and outward behavior will alter naturally. That's when we have a different walk. Inside versus outside. That process, and I've said it before, is the Holy Spirit working out sanctification. That's our walk. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate or meditate on the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, I don't get, have this overhead, but... Two verses before that, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, I will paraphrase them to you. It says, but, whatever, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That's believers. 17 says, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's the Spirit of God in us. Back in Moses' time, we went up to get the Ten Commandments. He came back down. His face was glowing so red that they couldn't look at him. That was the glory of God. So he put on this veil. And when he put on this veil, it would soften that so people could look at him and they wouldn't be scared or they would because they didn't understand it. But when he took off that veil, it was different. This is what happens. That veil... When he took off that veil, it had started to fade. So when it started to fade, really what that was talking about is that there is a time when the Old Testament will go away and the New Testament will come. And so this is why he said that. He says, whenever Moses turned to the Lord, he took off the veil. Likewise, we find freedom in Christ by looking to him. 
The Spirit gives us freedom from sin, death, and the condemnation of law. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to that, put that in English for you. Because when I read that, I mean, this is what I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit reveals to us. He, he tells us things that when we read it in the Bible, we may not get it if we are not dependent on the Holy Spirit or asking the Holy Spirit to explain that. But this is what he says. He says, so by reading the word, all believers behold the glory or knowledge of the Lord in Scripture and are transformed into the image of God. Christ is the image of God. It's called glory to glory or ever growing glory, which is knowledge. When we read the Bible, we get more and more knowledge. He says, as believers, we behold the glory, knowledge, of God in the word of God. And the spirit of God transforms us into likeness of Jesus Christ. This is called, the, this is a description of what is called a gradual process of sanctification. If we want to become like Christ, we must spend quality time focusing on him in his word, his thought life, his purpose, and his character. That's what we get. So his character becomes our character. The result then becomes raw material that the Holy Spirit of God uses to form Christ in us. So when we read scripture, it becomes a way of life for us. When God speaks, your response requires faith. Throughout scripture, when God reveals himself, his purpose, and his ways, the response to him is faith. Now, what is just said is that, look, we read the scriptures. The Holy Spirit is there because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and he's explaining. He's telling you. He revealed. God said, I'll send you the Spirit, and he will lead you, come alongside you. He will reveal things to you, but he will tell you not about himself. He'll tell you about things that he's seen. So when you're reading the Bible and you're reading those words, the Holy Spirit is telling you what that really means. He's giving you an ever-increasing glory, which means that you grow. And as you grow, God gives you more. As he gives you more, then you continue to grow. And that's how we grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You cannot grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ if you don't have knowledge of Jesus Christ. You have to get into the Word. When we get into the Word, that's when we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I hope you got that. Because when I read it, I, believe me, I had to read it a few times. Because, Lord, this is, this, this can, I know in a setting like this, it can be kind of, what do you say? But the Holy Spirit will tell you. A few weeks ago, Pastor David had a message, and it was called Lying in the Sand. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, that line of the sand is the time when we make decisions. It's the time when you come to this line and you got to make a decision to go over that line or you got to make a decision to do something different. Every day of our life, every minute of our life, we are at the line in the sand. You got to make a decision whether you want to do what God asks you to do or whether you want to be that old self and do what you always have done. Every day we got to make a decision all day long. So, it's called a line in the sand. Today, a little bit different. We're going to talk about the plumb line. You guys ever heard of the plumb line? Let me tell you what it's like. In construction, in painting, in all of the things that contractors and those people do, they have this piece of equipment called a plumb line. And it's a string with a, with a weight on it. And as long as it is straight, you will get a 90 degree angle. And that 90 degree angle keeps the painter, keeps the angle so that it will not get out of line. It will not fall out of place. Hmm. So this is what happens. No matter what happens while he's building that house, for this to be straight, the foundation, everything else is straight. He can move however he wants, but it will hold that right angle. Huh. Plumb line used in scripture, the Lord himself as a builder in Isaiah 28. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious stone, cornerstone for a sure foundation. Isaiah 28:16 says this. 
This is the promise of an unshakable kingdom with the Messiah in charge. Jesus Christ is that precious cornerstone. As the Lord builds the kingdom, he will ensure it is perfect in every way. Isaiah 28, 17 says it like this. As the Lord builds, okay, it says, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. There will be no crookedness, sin in the kingdom of God. Hmm. Amos 7. Amos was a prophet in, back in the days. You remember when God brought his people out of Israel, he got right, be, right before he got to the land of milk and honey, to the promised land. He had a couple of tribes stay on this side and he took the rest on the other side. Anyway, they were broken up into tribes. Right here in Amos, what happens is they've fallen out of line. They started having class. They started having different levels of people. They started having slaves. They started stealing property from one another. They started doing all of these things. And this is what he tells Amos. He says, the Lord was standing by a wall that had been built through the plumb line measure with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? The plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no more. When God said he was setting a plumb line among his people, he was declaring and into their attempts to justify the crooked ways. Because they made excuses just like we make excuses. No more excuses. The Lord was setting the standard. That's that standard. That plumb line. That standard don't change because of that plumb line. Standard of God. And he says, God does not negotiate his laws. He does not change with whims and desires of the culture. Hmm. In John 17, 17, why? Because the word is true. The word is true. That particular verse, what he's talking about, this is the, the, the clearest, clearest uh, show that Jesus knew that the word was true, that he was telling us that the word is true. The word is what we, what we use. It says people, she says, uh, the, the confidence in Scripture. People's opinion may vary. Experiences are notoriously trust, untrustworthy. But God's word always remains true. God's moral law is the plumb line against which we determine right from wrong. Every day we read that word. So no matter what we do, we don't fall out of line. Jesus is the word made flesh. Even though he suffered, his walk remained true to God's purpose. Holiness Separated for God, from for God. That's his holy. Now, continually in Peter, Peter was emphasizing that Christians can expect suffering as a natural part of life. Why? Dedicated to Christ, because Christ suffered. Suffering or war was and was and is God's tool to shape character, godly character within us, to make us holy like Him. Why? Because he's talking about our faith. He's talking about when we read the Bible and when we go through the, the, the process of sitting and meditating with the word of God, God, the Holy Spirit reveals to us truth. In 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, he's talking about the purity of that faith. He said, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials, don't we? These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes through refined by fire, he said, your proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Those trials and tribulations he's talking about, nothing specific except things we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Things that come up against us. He says, as purity of gold is brought forth by intense heat, so the reality and purity of our faith is revealed as a result of our fiery trials that we face. 
Ultimately, the testing of our faith not only demonstrates our final sanctification, salvation, but also develops our capacity to bring glory to God, or Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes into his kingdom and reign with us. Hmm. So that means that what we do right now really is a measure of how much we can glorify God or how we glorify God when we're in heaven. So that means there is no wasted time here, right? That means that we're not just living day to day. There is something that we need to be doing. And he says, we, we purify in our faith. And he says, suffering. He says, Jesus suffered. We have to suffer. First Peter 3.14 says it like this. 14 through 18. He says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Hmm. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you, your, your good behavior, how you're acting in Christ, may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Read it again. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Then 18 says, for Christ also suffered once for sin, righteousness for unrighteousness, to bring you to God, us. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Since not everything in this world functions as it should, those who God's will may undergo suffering. For righteousness sake, he makes it plain. He says, this is not just suffering. This is suffering for God. He says, make sure that when we suffer, it is only because we have served God faithfully and not because we have done anything wrong. That's undue suffering. That's on you. That's on us. And he said, we're blessed. Amen. We're blessed. It says, God especially honors those who suffer for doing what is right. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Just a reminder, that's the Beatitudes. And this, this, this is what he says, and I want you to follow this, because what he says, it, the Beatitudes emphasize characters. When reading these verses, the sentence shows that being proceeds doing. Follow me. Here it goes. He said, blessed being are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He said, blessed being. Are you, when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad, being, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted you, and persecuted the prophets, they will persecute you. Again, character stands, stands behind each of our thoughts and beliefs. Character. How, how, how about your character? What does your character look like? It should be the character of God. We study in the word of God. And then he said, don't be surprised by suffering. Why? Because we just said it. Because God, Jesus suffered. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice in so much as you participate in the suffering of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit and glory of for the spirit of glory and the spirit of God is what it says. Rest on you. He hmm. said it ain't a strange thing. He said, it, we don't, it happens. That's what happens. That's part of it. As Christians, we should expect and prepare for suffering. That's why I talk about teachable spirit. 
when we go through things, first thing, first thing, first thing we should always do is say, God, what do you want me to learn from this? Get on the page. Get on the right page with him. What do you want me to learn? And God will start talking to you and you know, walk us through it. And he said, not to just be holy, but live holy. That's two different things. That's, that's where you walk. I mean, we walk every day. He said, Peter went on to exhort the, 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 to the, oh, let me say it again. Peter went on to exhort Christians to live righteous and holy life through the evils they were experiencing. First Peter 1.22 says like this. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. We accomplish purification by obedience to God. That obedience is conversion. When we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that's when the purification is done. And it's not about anything we've done. It's about Jesus Christ. So that's why, how it purifies ourselves. He says, and then have a sincere love. A sincere love is one that's genuine, pure, and without hypocrisy. We ought to love our fellow Christians intensely out of true commitment to love, unconditional. Remember the commandments. Love God with everything you got and love your neighbor as yourself. So what God is saying is that if you love him with everything you got, there's no way that you cannot love your neighbor because he is the focus. And so what comes out of you is pure love. So that's what he's talking about, that unconditional love. We're part of the kingdom of God. And that's what God is building here, the kingdom. From the beginning to now, the kingdom has been built. The kingdom has already started. We are just not in the kingdom. 1 Peter 2, 1 to 6. It says, therefore, rid yourself of all malice, of all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, Jesus Christ, you also are living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. And the last verse says, for this, four. In scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious stone. God desires that we turn away from the things of this world, seek him fully. By doing this, we acknowledge that we accept what the world has rejected and that we reject what the world has accepted, good versus evil. It says, we have been chosen out of this world by God so we might act not as people of this world but as people of God, holy and separated. People can see that. They see that in your walk. They don't know what it is. They just see it. So this new building of, building of God is the assembly of all believers, the church, Christians, we are part of God's great spiritual building project. Since the beginning of time, Adam and Eve sinned, we lost. Jesus Christ came and did not sin, and God brought us back. And finally, look, this is what he says. Be alert. Be alert. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11 says, he given a warning. He says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. We all got it. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ 
after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you. Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Call the glory and the dominion. He says, God is in control of all things, but in this world, both in this world and in eternity. And I'm going to close by saying this. First Peter 5, 11, the last verse of that says it like this. He says, to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. God is good. God is good. You know what? I got to tell you. I got to tell you. Those scriptures, those scriptures are on the back of this bulletin. Man, I'm telling you, you guys, if you have never done it before, you get those scriptures and you use them in your daily word along with experiencing God, God will talk to you. God will help you. The Holy Spirit will lead and guide you. And he will show you the way that you should go. Amen? Amen. God is good.